Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech Community Matters. And we're talking to our old friend, uh, Brad Glosserman, um, with, uh, let's see, what, what are you now? You're a visiting professor at Tama University, the Center for Rulemaking Strategies, and you're also a senior advisor at Pacific Forum CSIS. And so in, you're in Japan, and we're talking to you about an article you wrote, Brad, uh, called Worrying Indicators in Japan and Elsewhere About Democracy by Brad Glossman. Welcome to the show, Brad. Oh, well, uh, thanks for having me, Jay. It's good to be back. Yeah, it's good to have you here. So can you give us a summary of the article? I mean, what you were getting at, what you said, and why? Well, the, the initial um, spark for the article was the renewed drive by the Japanese Prime Minister Abe Shinzo to push for constitutional reform. Uh, as you know, Mr. Abe is a conservative, uh, legisl a conservative prime minister who has really looked at changing and, and updating the Japanese constitution is sort of a legacy issue for him, one that he feels is really the hallmark of, of his, his administration and a lifelong goal. He feels as though that the constitution was imposed by occupation forces, unduly restricts Japanese capabilities, does not reflect Japanese character, and really needs to be a homegrown document. Uh, although, frankly, there's some historical scholars that suggest the draft was actually Japanese in nature and is less foreign, if you will, than... Um, uh, uh, then, then a lot of the conservatives like to complain. Um, so he's, at the beginning of the year, made a push that, for constitutional reform, which is a very difficult process. The Japanese Constitution has never been amended or changed and since it was promulgated at the end of the war. But his real focus is Article 9, which talks about, says, it's two sentences, it says Japan will never uh, possess the means of, uh, will not use war as an instrument of state policy, and will not possess the means to, to, to fight and prosecute a conflict. Uh, and the fact is, of course, that that is not kept pace. The Japanese have a, a very formidable military, by some counts, the fourth largest in the world, certainly, the, or, or the fourth most funded. It's it, today, even to this day, you'll notice the Japanese have a self -defense, ground self-defense force, a maritime self-defense force, an air self-defense force instead of an army, a navy, and an air force. And they'd like to just essentially, because this has been so contentious, among other things, what they'd really like to do is just legalize those and eliminate the, the constitute doubts about the constitutionality of those institutions. Sorry, it's long-winded, and I'm about halfway done. No, 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 this is very interesting, funny. yeah. And, and so the Japanese um, constitutional reform is generally taken as shorthand for just reform of this Article 9. In fact, however, there are an entire array of issues that would be addressed in, in any reform process, such as the role of the emperor within the country, privacy rights, the role of environment, the role of women. It is a long, stand, long list, potential list. And, and consequently, A, it is a politically fraught process because it's difficult to get agreement on this, but it's also... Um, a process that or, or, it, it's very poorly understood, you know, in, in the sense that constitutional reform is taken as shorthand for the military and changing Article 9 when it really does embrace a large, large array of, of issues and concerns. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is, is that, frankly, any study or poll that you've had which talks about constitutional reform is very fact-dependent on who's asking the question, how it's phrased, what the, res what, what the respondents think about it. And, you know, quite frankly, at this point, uh, there is great division in the Japanese country, with the majority by most polls actually going against uh, constitutional reform as they understand it, which again tends to be this Article 9 focus. But Abe, to go back, had started in the year by saying he was going to really push this new pro this process and make it a, a real focus of his work in his next administration. And there tends to be a reflexive kind of um, antipathy to constitutional reform, precisely because of a fear, which and this is where the article starts to take off. Because it appears that somehow Japanese democracy is not sufficiently deeply rooted. And that what you would have is instead of, you know, either one, a document that was potentially illiberal, not actually illiberal, but would in certain crises permit the government to begin to abuse its power. You know, and this is, these fears are rooted in what happened in the 1920s and the 1930s when Japanese democracy was subverted. So that's the fear number one, that, that somehow or other uh, authoritarian groups or, or, or leaders would somehow co-opt and, 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 and you know, undermine Japanese democracy. The second fear is that by 
by giving more latitude to the self-defense forces and legalizing them, that Japan would then become entangled in foreign uh, adventures, again, like has happened in the 30s, and that somehow or other this would be destabilizing and dangerous. So I wanted to address, frankly, to, to expose that language and make those, 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 those um, assumptions clear. And so, in my faith, frankly, I have a great deal of faith in Japanese democracy. Um, although even people that are not, I think, reflexively um, anti-change or reflexive, if you will, to the left, there's some very smart thinking people who also raise questions about this particular prime minister and his tendencies. And so there's, there's also, you know, an overlaying question of, of the degree to which the, the Japanese might be in favor of constitutional reform. And the problem is this particular administration pushing for it, this particular prime minister, and the processes which he's used. And that has been, if you will, a, frankly, a, a red flag that's been raised since Mr. Abe came into office. There have been a number of surveys that have shown that various administrative measures that he's taken, such as the passing of the le reinterpretation of the le legislation to permit the, uh, the, the security forces to do more, or the, the Secrecy Act or, or other changes, that the concern has been just the way this government's brought them about. So I begin with a defense, if you will, of the need for constitutional revision and a reason not to be so concerned. But as I started digging, I, I was, it came across or, or was reacquainted with a, a larger body of work, which has frankly blossomed in the last couple of years, which talks about what's called democratic deconsolidation. And the argument here is that the assumption, the working assumption has long been that um, democ democracy is a one-way path. You reach a certain uh, degree of, 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 of economic affluence, and societies become enamored and, and, and you know, embrace democratic life rights, and there's no backsliding. And the, that's been the assumption. And what we've seen in the last you know, three, four, five years in Europe, in the West, um, uh, not in Japan, interestingly enough, uh, has been, uh, if you will, you know, moving backwards on democratic rights and the concern that, you know, increasing numbers of people say that maybe that they're prepared to make some sacrifices in the area of liberal government, of, human, of, of certain rights, if it would guarantee them safety or security or efficiency. Mm -hmm. And um, as you look at the data, I mean, it's, again, not restricted to Japan, though. What I found as I dug into this is that younger Japanese seem more prepared to make those compromises. So. The conclusion that I reached was while my gut says Japan is healthy and Japan is nothing for us to worry about, and a constitutional debate is important, and I still think it is, even if you decide not to revise the Constitution, the fact that we would debate it and begin to appreciate better the significance of these rights, I think is a real plus. So, uh, but nevertheless, there are kernels and reasons to have some doubt and to have some longer-term concern about perhaps where Japan is going and, and, and what it's... Um, uh, what its potential and, and possible consequences are. Yeah, well, you know, Sorry, I mean, we've, we've, we've spent our lives, uh, you know, on the assumption, I have anyway, on the assumption that Japan became pacifist after the war, that it, would, it had forsworn weapons and had forsworn war in general, um, and that it was a sort of a, a very good, uh, a successful experiment in democracy that the U.S. created after the war. And there was no issue about it. It was inculcated deeply into the current Japanese culture. But you're saying is that there are a certain percentage of people, maybe a lot of people, who are tired of that and want to move to something else. No, I'd like to be careful. I mean, that, I think that overdraws the statement. I mean, number, first of all, the Japanese pacifism is largely anti-militarism. The Japanese have rarely said that they shouldn't defend their country, although, you know, that they're, it's a question of, you know, the projection of power. Interestingly enough, most surveys have shown that the number of Japanese who are prepared to defend their country is very low, you know, in the teens. You know, if you, there are a number of surveys that have asked, if your country was attacked, would you fight to defend it? And, you know, it's like 19% of Japanese under the age of 20 or 29 or something. <laughs> the largest number of people that are prepared to defend, which is like 35%, uh, is, is the older folks, which aren't going to be doing you a lot of good. <laughs> um, so, you know, be careful about pacifism versus anti-militarism. Then, secondly, I mean, the Japanese um, d democracy uh, or, or turnout, for example, in elections has been reaching new lows. And that reflects, I think, a certain dismay with, with the political choices that they have, a certain cynicism. Um, and uh, that, uh, but still, there's large support. Pew, Pew polls, for example, show something like 77% support for represent, uh, referendums and representative democracy. Um, you know, it, it is, um, it, the Japanese.
Japanese, you know, again, it's not as if they're prepared to try something else. I think it's that they are, when offered uh, alternatives or when told that there are certain costs that come with policy choices, that they're prepared to weigh those a little uh, differently. You know, they, they, they are, you know, it, it's every society that has, a generation that has grown up with things, you take them for granted. And so in my mind, you know, a, a debate um, about, you um, the merits of democracy and the, and, and the need to underappreciate and understand them is, is never a bad thing. Uh -huh. So in that sense, you know, debating a, a constitution is probably a good idea. Yeah, okay. Well, conversation is good. But would you agree with me that there, there's a dynamic here? There's a change, a sea change, maybe a yeah. slow sea change, but a change of some kind is happening. I think there's, there's shifts underway. As you put it, there's a dynamic at work. And again, it's not necessarily in Japan. I mean, oh, yeah, I, would, well. I guess you could... I guess what you could put, you know, is, is that if you combine the anti-militarism and, and the pacifism to what the extent of degrees exists along with, uh, you know, the kind of tiredness, if you will, and, and disinterest in democracy, it's not a bad place. I mean, that's apathetic versus angry people with pitchforks. You know, there isn't a hard xenophobic right here that's worthy of the name. Yeah. Uh, unlike, you know, you, you never see the demonstrations as you do in, uh, you certainly don't see a Charlottesville here. And you don't uh, you don't have the crazies of the, that are you know in Europe. And I'm wondering uh, about well, external but... forces, though, Brad. I mean, you know, you're talking about a sort of an internal thought process within the country, and you know, and, and the generations moving on. But um, you know, what about external forces? What about what's happening in China, which you know could be very intimidating? What's happening in North Korea, likewise, could be intimidating. What's happening in the U.S., uh, you know, could be kind of amazing to the Japanese now. How much? effect do these, you know, global, mm, global, global events have on the thought process you're describing in Japan? Well, I mean, they're, they're definitely part of it. I mean, when the Chinese, when the Japanese look at China, and I've long insisted that it's the case, they, you know, it's like a funhouse mirror that reflects everything that Japan has and, dis and distorts it, right? You know, the, the Chinese are a big country with nuclear weapons, a permanent seat on the United Nations Security Council. They are, have a dynamic economy. Um, you know, they are, they're, they're, their presence in the, in the world is expanding. You know, the Japanese are 127 million people shrinking. They have no nuclear weapons. They forsworn them. They don't have a U.N. Security Council seat. Uh, their economy has been, you know, largely stagnant for two-plus decades. You know, and, and, and the Chinese are flexing their muscles, and they've got historical chips on their shoulders. So that is, is of course, of, of concern. Uh, you have in North Korea a belligerent, a uh, little power that the Japanese feel as though, you know, the Japanese belief is that if North Korea ever shoots a nuclear weapon, it's going to be tamed to Japan. Um, they look at the United States and they see a partner that is, you know, frankly, a little difficult, extremely difficult to understand, but they have a good, they seem to have a good relationship with the president and the prime minister, and so they take some solace from that. But, you know, the Japanese, a larger set of cultural trends and social trends have been reinforcing what's called uchimuki, which is sort of an inward looking perspective. I think. My sense, and this is the long, a longer discussion, Jay, that you and I have, have had at various moments, yes. is that the Japanese really want to be left alone in the world. They want the status that they've earned. They want the perks that come with it. They don't want a great deal of responsibility, and they pretty much would like to be able to do their own thing without interference. They could be left alone, you know, the Switzerland of Europe hypothesis, which I, or of Asia hypothesis, mm -hmm. yeah. which I offered, gosh, uh, I wrote about 18 years ago. Um, that that's really where they'd like to be. And, and so, you know, a, a shrewd leadership in China, for example, would offer the Japanese a bargain that pretty much consists of their, if you will, isolation. <laughs> the Japanese know that their best bet is alliance and partnership with the United States. And thus, um, they will continue to maintain that relationship, I think, as long as they possibly can. Yeah, now that relationship is affected certainly by this current administration, and I want to talk to you about that. You know, we have our problems. Sure. I mean, some people feel that democracy is sliding down the, you know, sliding down the, the side here, um, referring to um, an article which you and I have both looked at, that is in The Guardian, um, and uh, also a, a short book by Yale history professor uh, Tim Snyder. We've, we've talked about that. And, and there are people in this country, you know, who have thought it through and, in their view, think that democracy is in great, great risk right now here. And I wonder if there's a connection between, you know, the problems we are having with, uh, you know, the way the government is working, um, the failure of the checks and balances that the founders, uh, you know, designed in the first place, um, the way there are, you know, bubbles and polar polarized groups in this country. Um, we've lost a lot of ground, a lot of people think. So, 
since we are a, a very strong ally for Japan, and Japan and the U.S. have a very strong historical relationship, how much does this affect? What, you know, what are the common what are the common denominators here? Um, does what is happening here affect them? Uh, should we find common denominators that make us question democracy in general? No, I don't think that's the case. I mean, I think just because you have common phenomenon doesn't make them common denominators, if you will. In other words, I think more defining in our relationship between the United, between the United States and Japan is a common concern about China across the board. You know, uh, and while I'm very uncomfortable with the idea that somehow or other we focus, you know, we, we use China as a glue, uh, that's increasingly the case. I mean, you look at, and I was just in Washington last week, and we're having these conversations. And, you know, if you look at what the, the tenor of the American strategic doctrine that has emerged in the Trump administration, and it as reflected in the documents themselves. So, for example, the national security strategy that was released in the end of last year, the national military strategy that, that followed, the defense strategy that followed it, and the national nuclear posture review, which was released on Friday. You know, what you end up with is a, um, you know, the foundational starting point for all that analysis is that we are re-entering an era of great power competition, and that the United States is competing with China and Russia. And then that is a fundamental, a marked difference from uh, the past. And um, you know, it's uh, this is not a uniquely Trump phenomenon, Trump administration phenomenon. I think we would have had a hardening in our relationship with both of those countries as well had Hillary Clinton won in the, the 2016 election. But nevertheless, that view is congenial to the Japanese. They see themselves as threatened by China. So. I would say that that is far more of a glue, if you will. Although I would, you know, there's another way to look at it, and 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 this is now we're getting into sort of, if you will, rhetoric and tactics, and that is that it seems equally powerful to say that what we have, what binds the United States and China, is the support for the existing rules-based order, and that therefore they would, they would, what they should be doing is acting in concert in ways to support that. And that's, I think that's true. Um, you know, Mr. The, the, the President Trump is, is has on the one hand displayed a certain contempt for multilateralism, and yet at the same time he still walks the walk on, in some ways uh, in regard to attending these multilateral meetings and to using them as ways of advancing American interests. So I guess you could argue that the larger philosophy is right, the tactical the strategy or the, or the means by which you use these instruments is, is I think, is, is very problematic. But again, you get to the same thing because uh, you don't want to call the rules-based approach an anti-China strategy, although in some ways it's a way of getting, of, of putting China, if you will, in the same box without explicitly targeting China, right? Uh, and thus, so that, that too becomes a glue. So, you know, the, the, the disparaging of democratic norms and the, the, um, the erosion of those norms in the United States and practices, as you and I have discussed in, in those articles, and then the increasing, if you will, um, willingness to seek alternatives in the United States, in Japan, in those, those polls that I refer to, they're not linked. And I don't think they're the basis for, for binding. They're just two, if you will, simultaneous phenomenon, not surprisingly simultaneous, because they're, they're triggered by, I think, similar sets of concerns. Well, you know, <clears throat> I just want to uh, point out that uh, China, China's a uh, very successful economy, it's obvious, and uh, they're, you know, they have manifest destiny kind of uh, aspirations these days, one belt, one road, and all that. They, they want to be influential in every continent you can think of. <clears throat> that must be threatening. Yes. But the other aspect of it is that their system is not democratic. Um, there's, and in fact, uh, we have Richard Hornick. He's a, he, he used to run Time magazine in China a long time and, and elsewhere. <clears throat> and he, uh, he's speaking with us. Uh, I've seen him at the China seminar here in Honolulu, and he's speaking with us next week. And then the proposition is that um, Xi, Jinping, Xi Jinping is into mind control, uh, and he's trying to establish um, a kind of profile, a, uh, a profile for every citizen based on the, all the data they have about every citizen. It's very invasive and allows some citizens, uh, you know, the, the right to take the speed train and other citizens not, um, based on how faithful they are to, to the administration. And so what you have is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's actually less 
in terms of uh, civil liberties, less in terms of human rights than it was a few years ago, because Xi Jinping, uh, with the success of his economy, feels uh, somehow that he can cut back on, on, um, you know, uh, on, on civil rights. So <clears throat> this all suggests to me anyway, and I'd like your opinion about it, that these days, the question of uh, civil rights, human rights, falls second to whether the country is successful from an economic point of view. And there are some people that think that democracy is too much tumultuous. It's uh, too many bureaucrats, too much obstruction, uh, too much difficulty in getting things done. Xi Jinping can do it overnight. Uh, in the U.S., we have a conversation, and it takes forever. To, and this is not only Hawaii, of course it is Hawaii, but it's other places in the country, and certainly it's in Washington. So the question is, you know, in the 21st century, given what we see in China now, given what Japan sees in China now, um, given the comparison with the system in the U.S., are we evolving to another kind of form of democracy, lesser democratic democracy, lesser libertarian democracy? And is it happening right around us right now? Um, no, we're not there yet. I mean, of course, that's a dystopian vision and it's possible, Jay. Um, but I mean, I think, number one, the mechanisms of control and surveillance are new. I mean, the fact is, is that you couldn't do what Xi Jinping wants to do now, uh, except in the past. Right? Uh, you couldn't do it in the past because you didn't have the, the, the processing, the storage, the sensors, everything to do the things in real time that, that, that the surveillance technologies permit. I mean, future-oriented folks could see it in 20 years ago. I remember reading reports about precisely that, and, and people were hoo-hooing or poo-pooing that as, as a, uh, you know, uh, 1984, although it was 1999 scenario. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, that, that's not... The technological developments. Secondly, I mean, what Xi Jinping and what China offers the world, I think, is the promise of techno of economic advancement. I mean, everybody takes Chinese money. I'm not sure that they take the Chinese system, and they take the Chinese money, and they take the Chinese system because the Chinese offer it to them on the cheap. And because what they're offering, it seems, in some ways, is, a, is just a better story. The Chinese are telling a better narrative. And the United States, I mean, unfortunately, what's happening is, is, you know, if you go to Southeast Asia, nobody wants to be in China's pocket, but there's nowhere else to go. The United States is, I mean, what the, the, the rhetoric of, of the current administration in, right now is we're not interested in offering you material support because what we really want to do is take more of your money because our trade debt is bad, right? <laughs> The, the, the very, you know, we, we're pulling out of TPP because, you know, we don't like, we, we, it's a bad deal. And the president has told you that the fundamental problem are, are, is that um, we are running trade deficits with countries, and he wants them to invest in the United States. So by definition, what he's saying is he's not going to offer you economic support. He wants to actually take the money of these countries. China's saying, no, 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 we have all this extra money. And, we, you know, we want to share the largesse. We see win-win solutions. Now, there's an element of hoo-ha to all of this. I mean, there's extraordinary self-interest. But nonetheless, it's, you know, you're pushing on an open door. Everybody wants choices. And everybody understands, too, that there are, when, as these deals tend to be, uh, over time, they realize that when the Chinese offer to build you a bridge and it falls apart in five years, as is frequently the case, you suddenly realize, well, oh, great, I don't have a bridge, but I still have that debt. Right? And <laughs> when the Americans and the Japanese are building infrastructure, that doesn't seem to be a problem. Yeah. Um, when the Chinese are negotiating or building that bridge, what they're basically doing is sending you Chinese concrete and they're sending you Chinese workers. And then the Chinese companies are going to actually, you know, drawing over the Chinese, the, the companies that are, you know, subsidiaries or, or, or associated. So, for example, they're not eating local food. They're having Chinese cooks come over and make their food and cook. They're, they're having... Chinese companies provide all of the, 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 the accoutrements of that. So you see it's an extraordinarily colonial and extractive process. And yet there's no other counter. And when the Chinese are offering to build you a railroad, what you find is not only do they want the right-of-way that accompanies the 6-foot or 10 or 12-foot wide track, they want you know, a half kilometer on each side of the median line. <laughs> so they're taking an extraordinary amount. And again, there's nobody there to push back. Yeah. So be really careful about talking about the extraordinary um, uh, attractiveness of the Chinese model when really what you're looking at is just kind of an absence of competition. So, it's a, I mean, it, 
it requires some money and it requires some vision and it requires some work. But it's not, I, I would be very careful to, to about the assertion that somehow or other the world is changing and, and that the Chinese are, are the, the absolute beneficiaries of this. And it, it is, they are the beneficiaries, but it's primarily because they're not being forced to compete. Yeah, well, we left the field. Essentially, we left the field. We, we, we dropped uh, TPP. We, we, don't, we don't care about uh, multilateral trade anymore. Um, and, we, and we make these grand statements that sometimes aren't true. And, and so the question is, uh, you know, if, if Xi Jinping sees this, and I think he clearly does, as a vacuum, he moves right into the vacuum. And this affects everybody who's watching, including Japan, including many other countries. Well, what you see is the Japanese pushing back, and you see the Japanese extraordinary. I mean, taking, I mean, Prime Minister Abe is taking some really great efforts, I think, to, you know, assert himself and to seize that vacuum or to fill the vacuum that has been created. And, you know, he's got limited capabilities to do that. The best thing he can do is be working with the United States and Australia and perhaps even South Korea on partnerships. But, again, in Washington there was great interest, but, you know, I can't tell you how many people are sort of saying, but you're going to have to go it alone. Um, so the opportunity is there, and it doesn't require an extraordinary vision to see that. To see, uh, to see it, to see it is none of that. We only have a minute or two left, Brad. I just want to ask you one question. What is your advice to this administration in dealing with what we've been talking about, in dealing with the dynamic we spoke about, in dealing with the long-term trends, in dealing with this rethinking, perhaps, of, of our system of government? Uh, what is your advice, and, and Japan's system of government, what is your advice to Washington? Well, it would be to... I mean, the advice is obvious, and it's not merely my own. I mean, the advice would be to get away from a system of America first or America. And as I say, it's not America alone, but, it, but as, as I was told, and I think quite rightly, it may not be America alone, but it is certainly going to be America left behind. The fact of the matter is, is that while we're pressing these bilateral advantages, that there is, um, you know, other people that are moving. And, and people want, I've heard a number of folks say, well, you know, just wait until this moment is passed and then the United States can step back in. The region will change. That, that, that position we would have filled may no longer be there. And so I think that there is no shortage of individuals in Washington and in part of the administration who understand what is at work here. The problem is, is that the executive, top levels of executive leadership just see the world in fundamentally different terms. And that they don't seem to understand the way that there is a larger system in order that flows from American leadership in which American costs, where, where the, 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 you know, the, the benefits of, of certain actions and certain expenses are not immediately visible. And thus, you know, we, if you look for a, a quick and immediate accounting, you will not appreciate all the gains that the United States has and the position that it's in. Yeah. Interesting spot to be in. But there's a time factor, isn't there? In other words, if we are isolating ourselves, uh, leaving the stage and all that, um, there are things that are, happening that are happening that may not be easily reversible in going forward. So every day that goes by, how, how, how important is the time factor here? Last question. I know it's extremely important, and I alluded to that, Jay. I mean, I wrote a paper a couple of years ago that argued that... Um, Japan was, you know, is, is where we started. And Japan was, in many ways, pressures and forces at work on Japanese society were in, in, encouraging it, if you will, to turn inward and to turn its back on the world. And what I recommended to partners, the United States and Australia in particular, um, was A, to recognize that and scale expectations back accordingly so that you don't find yourself in a position where you're overextended and, and over, you know, inflated expectations of what Japan will deliver. But at the same time, what you want to do is take every chance you can to grab Japan and pull it out and force it into engagements in ways that exploit those opportunities and allow it to play to its strengths and reinforce its outward tendencies. We're in a position now where it's up to Japan and Australia and Singapore and other countries, like-minded countries, Europe, et cetera, where they have to now take that, where you temper expectations of the United States and at the same time you pull the U.S. out and oblige it to engage. Uh, and, and make you know, make it difficult for it to turn its back, and make it difficult for it to shirk responsibilities, and pl and, and and turn away from the role that it's played in much of the post-war era. Thank you, Brad, Brad Glosserman. It's been a wonderful discussion. I really enjoyed it. I hope we can do this again soon. Brad Glosserman, uh, Tama University, uh, the Center for um, Rulemaking Strategies, and a senior advisor at Pacific Forum CSIS. Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you. Great to see you as always. Best to all in Hawaii. Aloha. <laughs>